Welcome to uh, AQ's Blog and Grill. Today we have a guest host, uh, Angela Paz. So uh, welcome, Angela. Thank you, Alan. I am honored to be your first guest host. The first question is people want answers. How similar are you to Don Draper? Don who? How similar is Madman to the real world? I love the series and I'm lucky enough to know two or three survivors <laughs> of that period. And uh, they will say that it was, it is a pretty good representation of a short period of time uh, before they all collapsed. And I think that's the, uh, the thing to consider was that lifestyle of the, of the drinking in the office and the, uh, and, and, the, and the, just the incredible freedom and wildness of, of that creative period could only last so long. And then the clients started to want more accountability. But during that period, it was, it was some glory years in, in creativity. These guys were uh, constantly on and they were driven by this need to, uh, it, we can create something that, that's gonna grab people, it's art. It's not advertising. In this industry where agencies come and they go, they rise, they fall, and they very often merge, mm. how has Quarry not only survived, but thrived? The, the core has always been, uh, will we have a team as opposed to a company? Companies are shaped like pyramids, where there's one person at the top and people go down from there. Well, as I learned from my friend Joe Phelps in uh, Los Angeles, pyramids are tombs. <laughs> they, they, they bury people in right, those things. Right. So I, I wanted to uh, help organize a, a, a team that had um, commercial viability and, and worked well more like, a, uh, more like a summer camp than like a uh, building, the, building mm -hmm. the pyramid. So I think that's what's kept us together. I mean, I have uh, three partners Glenn Drummonds and I have worked together for 29 years, mm -hmm. uh, Jay Fournier, 24 years, Ken White, 22 years. So we've put together uh, quite a uh, portfolio of experience and the clients like that. And, mm -hmm. and since we haven't had a lot of client shift either, uh, that stability uh, has, has continued. The key thing is, is to not let stability make you sleepy. Uh, you've always got to mm -hmm. be anticipating Okay, what are we gonna to need to do next? What we did yesterday was good. How are we either gonna do it better? How are we gonna do it faster? Uh, or how are we going to stop doing that so we can do something new? Mm -hmm. And 1993, we started uh, Interchange, which was our uh, internet company. Mm -hmm. And in 1993, not many people knew about the World Wide Web or right, the information right, superhighway. Yeah. How do I keep things fresh? How do right. we keep things fresh? Uh, I think innovation, uh, if I had a t-shirt that I could make, why don't I? I'll, you can I'll, make one, I'm you're gonna, in the industry. I'm going to make a t-shirt. Yeah. Okay. And the t-shirt's going to say, innovate or die. Every organization, no matter how mature they are, or even how elderly they are, or how successful they are, has got to start thinking like a startup. They, they, they've got to be lean and keen and looking to learn new things and unlearn the stuff that isn't relevant mm -hmm. anymore because that just slows you down. So it isn't about being a fast company, it's about being an agile company and it's being um, able to, well, the expression is shift happens. Right. Organizations now have to be a group of shift disturbers mm -hmm. uh, so that they, they don't get complacent and they don't think that good is good enough and take some risks and uh, I happen to think that failing forward is another definition for innovation. You, you, you fail fast, you learn fast, you keep, you keep going. Give me an example of, of failing forward. One of them would be our first uh, attempt at uh, database marketing. That was good. So we started a company called D-Basics. Right, yes, Get I it? remember yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> D-Basics. Wow, I mean, how could that fail? <laughs> because we didn't, I didn't, uh, go deep enough. I thought data was it, data's not it. Um, data's worth 10 cents a pound, mm -hmm. maybe even 10 cents a ton. Right, these days. These days. Mm -hmm. Knowledge 
is where the money is. That's where the gold is. That's where the equity is. How are your clients accepting all of this massive amount of information? You can't fear big data because it's there. Actually, it's right. always been there. We've always had data lying around. Mm -hmm. What big data means is that you're able to comb through it faster. Technology mm -hmm. combs through it. It's able to make connections and, and integrate some of the knowledge that you have about a customer over here and a distributor over here and uh, another customer over here and, and start putting them together. I think it has to become smart data. And then just like any research, unless you ask the data the right questions, mm -hmm. you're going to get information that isn't knowledge. You're going to get a stack of stuff and you have to go, oh, you know, what do I do with that? Mm -hmm. So if big data is just simply processing faster and deeper, it's not going to help your clients. Explain right. to me what brand means to you. A brand is a promise. And brand image is a promise made. Brand equity, promise is kept. Brands are stories. And actually, brands are stories we tell ourselves. And then we tell others. Like right. we, we see something and, and we think there's a, a thread of narrative in there that may resonate with us. And so we go, oh. That, that's kind of cool. Uh, unconsciously, we go, I see myself being associated mm -hmm. with that concept. The brand is a concept. Right. It's not a product. It is the customer who owns the brand because it's the way they think and feel about that brand, mm -hmm. not what we tell them to do. That may be an influencer. So indeed, brand purchases are very organic. We make brand purchases with the head, which is rational, uh, the heart, which is emotional, and then the gut, which is intuitional. It's your instincts, it's right. your intuition. <clears throat> so those three things kind of get together and we say, okay, I'll, I'll buy that. The heart or the emotion has the upper hand. Who do you admire? And don't give me Apple or any of your clients. Give me someone who, who may be flying under the radar. A brand I surely admire is uh, The Body Shop, uh, Anita Roddick. Mm -hmm. Brands have to resonate as much as they're relevant. And frankly, the body shop came into, into being from the UK uh, when the time was relevant. People were getting more interested in transparency. Where's this product coming from? What does the producer believe in? What are their values? You know, she was not the first to stop testing on live bunnies or animals. Right. She was the first to say, we don't test mm -hmm. on uh, live animals. Well, boom. So the, the brand started to get built with the, I identify with that. I want to be in, involved mm -hmm. in that, almost becoming tribal. What can new young startup companies, which there's plenty of around mm -hmm. here, yes. um, take from that? How can they break through the clutter of every amazing yeah. thing that's coming out now? Well, I think it, they have to. There's no question that the founders of these startups have got to put their own personal and professional values out there. Okay, we believe in this and we won't do that. Remember when the two Steves started uh, their company, they wanted to democratize the computer. Their goal was to bring the computer cost or a personal computer cost down so that anyone could have one. Right. And that the, the, the school boards could purchase a lower cost, easier to use um, personal computer. So as they said, as, and Wozniak has said, continues to say this, you know, we didn't start out to improve the um, IBM personal computer. We started out to change the computer world. We started out to make the world a better place. Tell me, what's next for marketing? There is no future for marketing. There's a tremendous future for branding, mm -hmm. and there's a tremendous future for something that doesn't exist, um, customering, uh, which then again is, you know, it's so funny how many organizations say, we are customer centric, we are customer centric, and they have not changed their business model right. since the 80s or 90s, the 1880s, <laughs> the 1890s. And so you, you really do have to be like the customer and mm -hmm. you have to like your customer a lot 
and respect them. Alan, I want to thank you for letting me be your guest host. You were an amazing interview as usual. Thank you.